Good afternoon from the West Coast. Good evening from the East Coast and good morning. Welcome to Welcome to the UCLA Taiwan in the World Speaker Series on LGBT and gay rights in Taiwan by Dr. Shizhan Dai. I am Min Zhou, Distinguished Professor of Sociology and Asian American Studies, Walter and Shelley Wang Endowed Chair in US-China Relations and Communications and Director of the Asia Pacific Center at UCLA. A few words about the UCLA Asia Pacific Center, which I serve as director. The Asia Pacific Center is one of the 27 interdisciplinary research centers and academic programs within UCLA's International Institute. Our center promotes greater knowledge and understanding of Asia and the Pacific region on campus and in the community through innovative research, teaching, public programs, and international collaborations. We focus on inter-Asian and trans-Pacific connections from historical, contemporary, and comparative perspectives, and encourage interdisciplinary work on cross-border and supranational issues on language and culture, politics, economy, and society, and the sustainability in the ongoing processes of globalization. Our center runs the program on Central Asia, Taiwan Studies Program, and Hong Kong Studies Program. We are also an academic partner of the Global Chinese Philanthropy Initiative and leading a new Pacific World Research Initiative on Asians in Latin America and Latin Americans in Asia. The Taiwan in the World program is part of our center's Taiwan Studies program, which is supported by the Taiwan Ministry of Foreign Affairs and TICO, Los Angeles. It aims to broaden academic conversations on issues related to Taiwan and build an international community of scholars well-versed with the Taiwanese culture and society. Please feel free to subscribe to our center's newsletter so that you can be updated with our future events on Taiwan studies and other activities. I would like to thank our center staff, Executive Director Elizabeth Leister and Assistant Director Aaron Mira for their support in organizing this wonderful event. Uh, please post your questions in the Q&A box, not the chat box in the Q&A box, and the moderator, Professor Ayub, will pass these questions to our speaker, Dr. Dai, during the Q&A session. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Philip Ayub, who will introduce today's speaker, Dr. Shi Jian Dai, and moderate the Q&A. Dr. Philip Ayub is an associate professor in the Department of Diplomacy and World Affairs at Occidental College. His research bridges insights from international and comparative politics, engaging with literature on transnational politics, sexuality and gender, norm diffusion, and the study of social movements. And he's published widely in these areas, including his recent book titled, When States Come Out, Europe's Sexual Minorities and the Politics of Visibility, published by Cambridge University Press. The book uses a mixed method approach combining quantitative and qualitative analysis of cases to explore the domestic conditions under which international norms governing LGBT rights are spread. His numerous publications have appeared in the American Political Science Review, Comparative Political Studies, the uh, Political Research Quarterly, and the European Journal of Political Research. Dr. Ayub teaches courses related to social movements, sexuality and politics, European politics and research methods. Professor Ayub, please go ahead. 
Thank you so much um, for that generous introduction. It's such an honor for me now to get to the most important part, which is to introduce our speaker, Dr. Dai, who's doing such important work by studying topics of comparative LGBT politics and social movements and applying them to the Taiwanese context. Uh, you know, I think that many of you who work on LGBT politics know we have far too little work on East Asia in this domain. And I know that I and my students are thrilled uh, to hear from you today, Dr. Dai. Uh, to introduce Dr. Dai, I would just like to uh, you know, share that uh, he is currently a postdoctoral researcher at UCLA's Asia Pacific Center. He received his PhD in political science from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Uh, and he studies the development of LGBT rights in East Asian countries, as well as examining how digital technology has reshaped the way politics and activism work in, contemporary, in these contemporary times. His research is situated at the intersection of political communication, social movements, and LGBTI politics. Uh, during his postdoc at UCLA, Dr. Dai is revising his dissertation into a variety of journal articles and working with his mentor, Dr. Lachnan Makami, on research topics related to gay rights in East Asia. Uh, his research projects have been supported by the Chang Ching Ko Foundation for International Scholarly Exchange, and he was awarded the 2021 Cynthia Weber Award for Sexuality and Politics. Uh, that's uh, given by the Sexuality and Politics uh, section of the American Political Science Association. A very important award uh, there. Congratulations. Um, I'm thrilled to collect your questions uh, again in the Q&A box. Uh, so, um, uh, so please feel free to, to send them there at any point uh, for when we get to the Q&A. But now, most importantly, I would invite Dr. Dai to go ahead with uh, his presentation. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ayub, and uh, please let me share my uh, screen. So uh, could uh, everyone see my screen? Okay, so uh, thank you, Dr. Ayub, again, for the great introduction. And uh, hello, uh, everyone. Thank you so much for coming today. And I'm Sujan Dai, and it's my great pleasure to present uh, my research uh, today. And uh, this project looks at the uh, how gay right how, how ideas of gay rights are described and communicated by pro and anti gay rights groups in Taiwan, with a special focus on same sex marriage and LGBTI curriculum. So uh, before I present my research findings, I think it would be important for me to uh, say a few words uh, about what motivates me to conduct this research. And uh, this is French Quarter in New Orleans. And I can still vividly remember how thrilled I was when attending the Pride Parade there in 2013. It's not just because I had a cut of beer in my hand, but uh, it's mainly because I got a sense of uh, belonging even in a place where I had just arrived in less than one year. So I saw people smiling at each other. People were there for different reasons. Some were there for fun, some to accompany their friends, and some to uh, come out and show their true identity uh, for a political cause. Regardless of this sense of togetherness, nostalgia struck me off guard. Before I came to the uh, US, I have attended pride parades in Taipei, the capital city of Taiwan, several times either as a participant or a volunteer. And what I saw in New Orleans or the French Quarter reminded me of the, uh, of the old memories I had back in Taiwan. Everything seemed so similar. The rainbow flags, the flamboyant outfit of some participants, as well as the chanting of equal love. So it made me wonder whether what was happening in Taiwan is just repeating what had already happened in Western societies. So the question is, uh, is Taiwan just, quote unquote, another case following the global trend of legalizing same-sex marriage? For those who say yes, they would argue that uh, the legalization of same-sex marriage is a result of piracy diffusion. Uh, and this argument is built on uh, the idea of uh, the modernization theory with an uh, Eurocentric assumption, which treats the global south, uh, sorry, which treats the global north as the court 
uh, while social transformations happening in the global south follow the trajectory of their northern counterparts. However, for those who's, who are opposed to this uh, argument, they would highlight ideas of cultural relativism and call for closer attention to uh, the local contextual factors that may complicate uh, this simplistic picture proposed by modernization theorists. To make sure that we are on the same page, I would like first to propose uh, some definitions that uh, are uh, that speak to the key terms uh, included in this project. So framing, framing is the act of giving meanings to an entity. It could be a political event or a political uh, or a political figure, with a purpose of garnering support from the audiences, and the result of uh, these framing processes are the policy frames. So policy frames can be understood or defined as the interpretive schemas individuals used to understand the outside world, while master frames are those broader clusters of ideas that speak to uh, sound of the underlying ideological values of a society. So for example, under the master frame of the constitutional frame, we can observe various types of policy frame, such as equality, freedom, and anti-discrimination. So looking at previous literature uh, on the topic of gay rights framing, uh, most of uh, them are situated in Western societies. And they, uh, the findings suggest that gay rights has become, uh, the issue of gay rights has become a wage issue that exacerbates the cultural wars between liberals and conservatives. And it has also been found that pro and anti-gay rights advocates tend to highlight different sets of ideas with the pro-gay rights advocates uh, tend to stress ideas related to different kinds of rights and uh, the constitutional principles. Love is also a common topic uh, raised by uh, pro-gay rights advocates and there's an internal debate regarding whether the uh, US pro-gay rights activists should have used the friend of love more frequently than uh, constitutional principles because the friend of love uh, uh, has been argued to be more effective in terms of uh, making people feel sympathetic or empathetic toward uh, the political cause advocated by pro-gay rights activists and could encourage the audiences to take further political action. Uh, so, and for the anti-gay rights advocates, they tend to highlight ideas related to social norms and direct democracy. And uh, a con in the context of the United States, uh, the anti-gay rights advocates also call uh, gay rights as a kind of special rights in order to make a distinction between gay rights and civil rights. And, uh, uh, so they, uh, they have argued that skin, skin color is not equal to sexual orientation. And that debate could be further traced back to the controversy regarding whether sexual orientation is something determined by nature or by nurture. So even in cases where uh, activists of both sides mention the same term, such as freedom, they interpret it differently. So for the pro-gay rights activists, they mention freedom often in the context of freedom to marry or freedom to uh, decide with whom to build an intimate relationship. However, for the anti-gay rights advocates, they tend to use freedom in the uh, situation uh, related to religious freedom. That is, under what circumstances, individuals can treat gay and straight people differently with, uh, with, with religion being taken into consideration. So although previous literature has provided uh, substantive insights into how gay rights are being framed, uh, however, these studies tend to be static and descriptive in nature. That is, they do not explain in detail how policy frames have changed over time. And they are also mainly derived from uh, case studies of the global north. And here, I would like, like to argue that 
uh, the case of Taiwan deserves closer attention, not only because it's the first Asian country to legalize same-sex marriage, but also uh, it's also a unique case uh, where different cleavages exist. So politically, uh, national identity and cross trade relations are the most uh, salient issues. Religiously, unlike uh, Western societies, most people in Taiwan believe in Buddhism or Taoism or a mixture of the two uh, known as the folk religion with a relatively small Christian population. Culturally, there's also a generation gap regarding the effect or the influence of Confucian value with younger people uh, less affected by such political culture. So, uh, uh, in this research, uh, I try to focus on the idea of policy frames instead of policy outcomes, because I believe by doing so, it would help us to learn more about the nuanced, na the nuanced nature regarding how ideas of gay rights are contested in the society. And by focusing on policy frames, I try to answer the following two questions. First, what kinds of frames are proposed by pro and anti-gay rights groups in Taiwan? Second, are there any localized framing elements that can be uniquely found in the context of Taiwan? So to identify the policy frames and uh, master frames embedded within the uh, political messages of uh, the advocates, I adapt the uh, thematic content analysis approach, which is a two-stage coding process. So uh, working with two other coders, deductively, we generate an initial code book based on the literature uh, of gay rights framing uh, on, uh, in Western societies. And then we randomly select 50 uh, sample texts from, uh, the, uh, from the two advocates group and then apply the initial code book at the first stage of coding to these uh, sample texts. During the process of the first stage coding, we also recorded uh, new policy, uh, new types of policy frames and keywords of policy frames uh, in this process. And then we come back and we came back and revise the code book and then uh, use the revised code book to code the whole corpus at the second stage of coding. And uh, at the end, we compute in scores of intercoder reliability between uh, pairs of uh, coders. And the lowest score of intercoder reliability uh, is 83%, which is, uh, sorry, yeah, 83%, which is above the threshold of 75% suggested by the previous literature. So to balance, uh, since the coding process is very time consuming, so to balance both uh, representativeness and uh, feasibility, I choose to focus on the two most uh, popular uh, pro and anti gay rights groups in Taiwan. So for uh, the, and the degree of popularity is determined based on the number of followers uh, each group has on their Facebook uh, public uh, fan pages. So for the pro-gay rights side, we have Taiwan Alliance to promote civil partnership right, TAPCPR. And uh, this group is composed with a group of uh, legal experts and uh, lawyers. And they help, to, they help to propose three draft bills regarding a diversified family formation back in 2009 and 2012. They also help activist Ti Jiawei to file a constitutional review of uh, marriage laws. And this case later led to the ruling which legalized same-sex marriage in Taiwan. Uh, on the uh, anti-gay side, we have Collision for the Happiness of Our Next Generation, which was founded in 2013. And it was one of the prominent groups in Taiwan that advocated traditional uh, family values. And it also, uh, helped, it also successfully pushed for three anti-gay rights ballot measures in the 2018 election. And these three, uh, and, uh, these three ballot measures won 
overwhelming popular support among voters uh, at that time, which is about one and a half years after the Constitutional Court made its decision to legalize same-sex marriage in Taiwan. So the text data are collected from the public Facebook fan pages of the two addis groups. And the time period of collection starts from uh, the end of 2013, when uh, activist groups have become uh, more organized and mobilized in Taiwan. And it ends in early 2020, which is about 10 months after the legalization of same-sex marriage. The total number of posts is around, it is about 1,200, and the total number of Mandarin words included in the whole, in the whole corpus is about 160,000 Mandarin uh, Chinese words. So to compare the framing patterns between these two groups, I also calculate the proportions of policy frames and master frame, which is uh, by uh, dividing the number of each policy frame and master frame with the total number of frames observed in the corpus. So based on the results of the uh, thematic content analysis, it shows that there are 23 identified policy frames and seven master frames. So for the rights frame, it shows that there are certain things people are entitled to have to live their lives as human beings. But the major point of contention here is to what extent or whether these entitlements should be considered fundamental rights and then protected uh, by public policy. Uh, the, rationality, the rationality frame evaluates the costs and benefits of a policy change and justify why such a change may be desirable or not. And for both sides uh, of, of this debate, they oftentimes use scientific research to justify their arguments. So for the pro gay rights side, they argue, uh, they use the research in psychology and sociology to show that same-sex couples are equally competent as parents when compared with their heterosexual uh, counterparts. And for the anti-gay rights uh, advocates, they cite research in public health to show the prevalence of sexually transmitted diseases in Taiwan and argue why uh, the progression of gay rights as a form of sexual liberation might make this social problem even worse in this society. And the reactionary, reactionary frame prioritize, frames prioritize the status quo, which is rooted from both religious teaching and social norms. So for example, this is a picture of uh, Ma Tzu. So for the pro-gay rights activists, they point out the uh, compassionate and inclusive characteristics of some traditional deities uh, uh, in Taiwan. So they mentioned uh, the, uh, the benevolent uh, goddess of sea, Ma Tzu, uh, who promotes uh, harm social harmony and peace in the society. And they, uh, the pro-gay rights activists argued that love does not discriminate uh, before Ma Tzu, since uh, when she was incar incarnated, uh, she made a promise that she will protect anyone who call upon her regardless of who they are. The constitutional frames lay out principles that are commonly found in constitutional texts, such as equality, liberty, civil rights, and anti-discrimination. Both the pro and anti-gay rights advocates uh, discuss these values in their messages, but they disagree on how these principles should be applied. For example, is marriage equality guaranteed under the constitution? And this question is highly debated by both sides. The mobilizing frames call for support and action from the audiences. These mobilizing frames are used to create a sense of collectivity or, uh, uh, or uh, as well as to disapprove approve, uh, opposing arguments by associating their opponents with negative labels, such as producers and spreaders of misinformation. 
the populist frames stress popular sovereignty and or an anti-elite sentiment. So for example, uh, after the Constitutional Court made its decision to legalize same-sex marriage in Taiwan, the anti-gay rights advocates argued that we can't let these uh, 15 grand justices of the Constitutional Court make such a big decision because uh, the uh, opinions of these few political elites could not, could hardly represent uh, what the Taiwanese people think. So there's actually, they want to highlight a gap between uh, the thoughts or opinions of political elites and the, 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 the mass public. Lastly, uh, echoing a feminist and critical theories, the critical frames challenge the existing social oppression, such as patriarchy and heteronormativity. So uh, the so I think the results suggest that similar to Western uh, societies, Taiwanese pro and anti gay rights groups also uh, tend to rely on certain policy frames. Uh, and the difference of usage frequency in most cases are statistically significant. So 16 out of 23 cases, uh, uh, can we observe significant gaps of usage, sorry, between uh, pro and anti uh, gay rights advocates. But it should also be highlighted here that both groups use all of the 23 policy frames. That is, they don't stick with just a few sets of policy frames, but instead they also uh, incorporate some of the arguments used by the opponents and try to refute or falsify or invalidate uh, their opponents' uh, arguments. So for the pro-gay rights group, they uh, tend to highlight the idea uh, related to the rights frame and the constitutional frame, and they also are more likely to mention the identity frame, such as using words like tongzi or huoban to build uh, or to increase internal cohesion uh, among LGBTI individuals. Uh, on the other hand, for the anti-gay rights group, they have a uh, triangular argumentative style that is commonly found in their uh, messages, which is a combination of the populist uh, rational, uh, rash, rationalist and uh, reactionary frames. So in this uh, argumentative style, they will first highlight how uh, policies of gay rights would impact negatively, uh, would have a negative impact on the status quo and the great social uh, codes we as a society will have to burden if these policies were to be passed. And they will also highlight ideas such as uh, people are the masters of the country. So it's people who have the agency to stop all these from happening. However, it should be uh, noted that in the case of Taiwan, in comparison to Western societies, we rarely see the mentioning of frames related to religion and civil rights. And furthermore, I have also observed that there are unique framing elements adapted in the local context of Taiwan. And they, uh, they can be sorted into, into three major categories, social order, national identity, and minority protection. So for social order, these localized frames reflect the influence of the Confucian culture in Taiwan. And it centers on the idea of Lan Ren, which can be understood as relationship-based obligations that is family-centered. And given their different temporalities, uh, uh, frames of social order include three key ideas that speak to uh, the, this family-centered uh, concept of Lan Ren. So looking back to the past or retrospectively, it's uh, ancestral veneration and the concept of Xiao Dao and looking at the presence or currently its family appellation and looking forward or prospectively its blood type. And here I will uh, take family appellation as an example. 
So this is a family tree to show the complex kingship terminology in Taiwan. And the title of a family member uh, is determined based upon several factors, uh, his or her sex, seniority, paternal or maternal lineage, as well as blood type. In comparison, the terminology, uh, the terminology of kingship in English is much simpler. So uh, for example, for the word cousin in English, it can be referred to eight possible scenarios in Mandarin Chinese or Taiwanese Mingnan. So it can, uh, for the word cousin, it can be interpreted as uh, in both uh, in either Mandarin Chinese or uh, Taiwanese Mingnan. Uh, furthermore, uh, the Taiwan Taiwanese kingship terminology is also highly gendered in nature. So, for example, if we look here, uh, if you want to address your son's spouse, it's assumed to be Xinbu or Xifu. And if you look at the characters attached to these two words, it's a character uh, signifying the idea of women or female, right? So it's assumed that your son's or the son's a son's spouse or partner is uh, is a female, right? And it's also true in the context of uh, for 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 the word daughter. So the spouse of a daughter is nu xu or gia sai and the word xu or sai in um, mandarin chinese and taiwanese is uh it means husband right so the kingship uh system is not only gendered in uh mandarin chinese or uh, taiwanese Mingnan, but also a uh, heterosexual or heteronormative in nature so the pro gay rights advocates argue that if same-sex marriage were to be passed, then it will negatively impact the current system of kinship terminology and generate lots of confusion. For example, how could you address your son's partner? There's no corresponding title in our current system, right? And however, for the pro-gay rights uh, advocates, they also recognize this issue and this problem, but they argue that, well, it's exactly a good opportunity for the Taiwanese society to adapt more gender neutral language, right? So instead of using husband or wife, we can use partner, right? To, uh, uh, to, to address uh, someone's uh, spouse. And by doing so, the pro-gay rights advocates also argued that it could reduce the difficulties transgender people uh, face in their daily lives, especially lower the risk of them being misgendered. So the second uh, category of localized frames is originated from the debate on national identity and uh, cross trade relations. And uh, for some people, the legal status of Taiwan is still controversial. And uh, it could be argued that the two sides of the street is still in a literal is literally uh, still in a civil war uh, with one uh, with each other, and the two major parties in Taiwan are divided uh, in terms of their stances uh, of cross trade uh, policies. So for the Kuomintang or the KMT, they adapt the one they adapt the one China principle based on the 1992 consensus. And uh, they would argue for closer ties with uh, China. And some KMT members are also open to eventual unification uh, with China. However, for the uh, currently ruling party, the Demogra uh, Democratic Progressive Party, the DPP, uh, it rejects the 1992 consensus and it advocated uh, it advocates a Taiwanese national identity, and more uh, DPP members are uh, open to the independence of Taiwan as a sovereign state. 
So for this second uh, localized framing element regarding national identity, the Taiwanese pro and anti gay rights advocates both stress the differences between Taiwan and China. So both sides recognize democracy as a defining feature of Taiwanese identity, which uh, makes Taiwan distinctly, distinctively different from China. However, their emphasis differs. On the one hand, the pro-gay rights advocates stress that uh, protection of human rights uh, is the basis of democracies and LGBTI rights are an integral part uh, of human rights. And on the other hand, when talking about democracy, the anti-gay rights advocates argued that uh, important social policies like same-sex marriage should be decided based on the popular will uh, in democratic societies. So when the DPP government tried to uh, uh, pass the special law, which legalized formally legalized same-sex marriage in Taiwan in early 2020, uh, the anti-gay rights advocates argued that uh, if DPP uh, enacted uh, this a special law, which basically treats same-sex couples uh, as heterosexual couples, then uh, what's the difference between China and, P the, and uh, the PRC? Uh, sorry, what's the difference between Taiwan and the PRC or China? Uh, since the government also do not take the uh, people's opinion seriously because uh, in the referendums uh, of the, uh, of the 2018 elections, it shows that the a, a super majority of people are opposed to, uh, were opposed to same-sex marriage at that time. So if the DPP push for such a special law, then uh, similar to China or an authoritarian state, it uh, just neglect it just neglects, neglected the popular will of the Taiwanese society. And the third category of localized frame speaks to the idea of minority protection. So Taiwan is a society with different ethnic and social groups and uh, gay rights have been argued either as an obstacle or a remedy to group conflicts in this society. So, uh, for example, the anti-gay rights advocates state that the passage of same-sex marriage would further marginalize the indigenous people's uh, social status because the indigenous people on average are more likely to face social problems like teenage pregnancy and, uh, and or single parent families. So, uh, gay rights as a form of sexual liberation, it will make the indigenous people even more vulnerable if we allow such a trend of sexual liberation to persist. Sorry. And then uh, for the pro-gay rights advocates, they incorporate the tragic life stories of the LGBTI individuals to legitimate their policy claims of both same-sex marriage and LGBT uh, curriculum. So on the left-hand side, uh, his name is Ye Yongzhi, and he was found dead in his school in his school bathroom on uh, June 20, 20th, 2000, when he was just 14 years old. His actual cause of death is still unclear, but it's argued that gender bullying directly or indirectly uh, caused his death. And uh, in 2018, uh, Taiwanese pop star uh, Jolene Tsai uh, released a song, Womanly, to commemorate uh, this tra tragedy. And part of, part of the lyrics reads, never let anyone uh, change who you are or a girl, uh, sorry. Uh, you can be whichever you want. There will always be someone willing to love you. Sorry. Yeah, and on the left hand, uh, sorry, on the right hand side, uh, in October 2016, Jake Picou, a lecturer on French literature in National Taiwan University, committed suicide one year after his partner, Zheng Jingchao, died of cancer. 
even with their nearly 40 year partnership, they were still legal strangers. Uh, no right to make medical decisions for his beloved one, and no right to incur in the properties they commonly shared. And it has been argued by his close friends that the reason why he ended his life is uh, due to the fact that, uh, not just because of the loss of his loved one, but also because of the fact that they were still being alienated by law. So the pro-gay rights advocates argue that the government should take action to prevent these kinds of tragedies from repeating themselves, given that LGBT population are still uh, facing the dual and de facto discrimination. So the findings of this research show that there are similar frame patterns between Taiwan and Western societies. So the pro-gay rights advocates tend to highlight ideas related to the rights frame, as well as, the consti as, well as constitutional principles while the anti-gay rights advocates uh, more frequently adopt the populist reactionary and uh, rational, uh, rationalist frames. And uh, it has also been found that uh, the activists of both sides uh, creatively uh, woven uh, concepts that are localized in nature and speak or resonate with the uh, Taiwanese political culture as well as uh, 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 local events that had happened related to uh, the issue of gay rights. So uh, one of the, another implication of this work is that for both uh, pro and anti-gay rights advocates, they also use the, the tactic of stigmatization. That is for the pro-gay rights advocates, they call their opponents as spreader of misinformation while the anti-gay rights are, uh, activists called uh, the pro-gay rights activists as agents pushing for sexual liberation. And these, by adopting such a tactic of stigmatization uh, or using social media as the main platform of communication, I uh, would argue uh, that uh, it would uh, further lead to greater degrees of political polarization. Uh, observed uh, in among the public. So thank you so much for your attention today and uh, questions are highly welcomed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Da. That was a really fascinating presentation. I'm going to invite our, uh, our participants or attendees to add their questions to the Q&A box. Um, I have one, one there already, but I will collect some uh, more. And if, if you don't mind, I, I would ask a, a question about change over time in the frames, which is something you mentioned at the beginning, but I would like to understand a little bit more because we know from other contexts, for example, Central Eastern Europe, that a lot of times the interaction between these movements shows that they mirror or borrow frames from each other. Uh, for example, that uh, the LGBT movement is often uh, referred to as foreignly imposed by oppositions, so by local oppositions, where there's their so-called ideas from the outside coming in. Uh, mm -hmm. And thus, the uh, th we've seen, for example, in Poland, how the use of universal frames, the equality anti-discrimination frames, have sometimes actually went to mimic some of the, the counter movements arguments where they want where the LGBT movement wants to emphasize their rootedness, which I think is what you call localized uh, mm -hmm. frames, you know, their rootedness, they draw on religion, they draw on indigenous uh, term terms from queer communities, draw on national symbols, have stopped using some international symbols. So we see actually over time that the, the, the types of frames being pulled shift. And I wanted to know if you could talk about that time dimension, also the kind of the foreign imposition frame that sometimes we see in other contexts, whether that is connected to these geopolitical debates in uh, Taiwan. And thank you, I, uh, Dr. Ayub, for, uh, for this uh, fascinating uh, question. So I do agree uh, that uh, group interactions affect a lot of like uh, the decisions uh, advocates made regarding what types of frames to be proposed uh, in their political discourse. And uh, I think uh, I would just use one example here to, uh, to show or to, uh, to demonstrate like the influence of group interactions. So, uh, so for uh, so it's very interesting because in Taiwan we use Tongzhi to call uh, LGBT people, right? But actually, there is uh, there is no corresponding word when uh, 
uh, Taiwan, uh, this uh, uh, localized uh, context is uh, being exposed to like the uh, the globalizing trend of legalizing same sex marriage. So uh, we uh, some of the local activists in Taiwan they also uh, just use uh, LGBTI individuals to address uh, like sexual minorities. And another word, but some of them try to translate it into the context of uh, semantic context of Mandarin Chinese, and it's called. Uh, like uh, diversified, uh, sexually diversified uh, individuals. So, so in this context, we can see, yes, or uh, the diversified uh, gendered uh, individuals. So actually in this situation, the pro-gay rights advocates when facing like uh, the phrases or terms used in uh, Western societies, they try to incorporate it uh, into like Mandarin Chinese or into the local context uh, by highlighting uh, some similarities between the, the two languages. But uh, after the pro gay rights advocates coined the term Doyuan uh, Qingyu or Doyuan Xing Bie the anti gay rights advocates sexualized this term. That is, they focus on the sexual aspect of. What it means by LGBT people, right? So when talking about doyuan qingyu or doyuan uh, sorry doyuan xing bie, it they focus on how it differs from like uh, from the heteronormative uh, understanding of sexual sexuality, and uh, in addition to uh, the effect of group interaction, political events also matters regarding what types of frames are being highlighted or mentioned by the advocates. So after the, legal, after the constitutional court made its decision, uh, when talking about democracy, uh, it's, uh, it, we see a increased focus on the idea of direct democracy uh, by the anti-gay rights advocates because uh, they now treat referendums as their major policy tool to, uh, to, uh, to reshape how we should uh, progress as a society regarding LGBTI rights. Yeah. That's fascinating, so interesting. Um, also in terms of referenda for minority rights is also a very tricky idea in terms of how to, uh, you know, whether that should go hand in hand, but it's really interesting case. Thank you so much for, for your answer. I'm going to read a question from the chat now, and I want to remind our audience that they can add more, um, but I do have a question here from Gregory uh, 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 Abbey, uh, excuse me if I mispronounced your last name. Um, the question is, was ancient and prehistoric Taiwan known to be anti-gay or pro-gay based on uh, what you know from written records. This question relates to the citation of a traditional deity, Matsu, I believe. So um, yeah, I think uh, I'll just add, you know, that a lot of these identities like gay identity are probably more, more contemporary, but maybe I think this question might be referring to, um, you know, same-sex uh, uh, attraction, but I'll pass it to you, um, Dr. Dai. Okay, thank you. So uh, th thank you for, for this uh, great question. So I think, uh, uh, based on, especially uh, focusing on the, the, the messages proposed by Korean anti-gay rights advocates, they, they do not mention, or they have not mentioned uh, religious symbols or deities that much, to be honest. And I guess mm -hmm. a lot of it has to do with uh, the fact that both Tao, uh, in Taoism and Buddhism, sex is not publicly, publicly discussed. And mm -hmm. so, so that's the major reason why. And, and to be honest, uh, homosexuality has never been uh, considered as a sin by uh, these religious teachings ex explicitly. Yeah, so I think in the context of Taiwan, uh, where Taoism and Buddhism prevails, uh, we do not see that much reference this related to how should we reinterpret the religious teaching in order to legitimate uh, the, uh, or to accept or to embrace uh, 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 different forms of sexuality. But, uh, but one thing that 
th that did not come up in the out of its uh, messages, but has been argued by uh, by some religions experts is that uh, so uh, Matsu is a symbol of folk religion, uh, but in terms of Buddhism, uh, there is another deity called Guan Yin, and it has been argued that Guan Yin can take different kinds of forms. It can be uh, Guan Yin can be male or female, and it has been used uh, as a symbol to show, even in terms of Buddhism, uh, transgender uh, identity uh, is also mentioned or uh, recorded in such a religious teaching. Wonderful, thank you so much. I have another question from an anonymous uh, attendee who's asking, uh, LGBTQ plus seems to be more apparent on Chinese social media. Does Taiwanese social media show more representation of it or does it show more opposition towards it? Oh, so uh, thank you very much for, for this question. So, uh, let's see. Actually, I'm I'm not so sure about like uh, like how LGBTQ plus are being represented on uh, Chinese social media. To be honest, because we know that especially in these uh, recent years, I think uh, uh, in the in the past year, the Chinese government has been quite restrictive in terms of allowing opinions related to. Uh, uh, homosexuality or uh, same-sex relations to be expressed, uh, not just in like public media or mass media, but also on social media. So, so we do see uh, uh, more censorship has been imposed in this regard. So, yeah. So. Uh, See, but but uh, so uh, so I think this question uh, answering this question. Although I I and I need to uh, do more research related to like uh, social media representation of LGBTQness in China. But based on my expertise of how LGBTQ plus are being represented in uh, the social media landscape in Taiwan, I think there are a lot of uh, there are more and more YouTubers or uh, internet influencers. Uh, who come out as LGBT individuals. And the number is not only increasing, but uh, the content or the, the way they present their, uh, their identity has become more and more diversified. So previously, uh, we see a lot of uh, discussions. So, so there are uh, different kinds of topics being brought up uh, or performed by these uh, LGBTQ influencers in, ta in Taiwan. So some of them talk about uh, their uh, relationships and some of them uh, discuss some of the sexualized uh, aspect of, uh, of uh, the LGBTQ uh, community. So, right. so I think, yeah, for, for, for the uh, uh, media landscape in terms of uh, social media and uh, Taiwanese LGBTQ uh, individuals, there are uh, more people, especially on uh, YouTube or uh, Instagram, to be willing to share their life stories as uh, LGBTQ uh, uh, persons. Thank you. I'm going to, we have about three minutes left, so I'm going to ask uh, one more question from the Q&A uh, from Navita Wang, who's asking, uh, who's first thanking you for your presentation, Dr. Da, and then besides asking besides online messages, do you observe this dynamic among activist groups in other arenas? Do you foresee other Asian countries to advance their protection of LGBT uh, and gay rights following the steps of Taiwan? Um, and actually, if I could just add a, a little bit related question, I'm curious about the international networks of activist groups. You know, We have regional groups like ILGA Asia that connect to broader international themes that, that must influence framing. And also on the anti-gay side or anti-LGBT side, we know that groups also from various religions, uh, you know, work at like the World Congress of Families, et cetera, that include activists from many different countries that also shape frames on the family, on reproduction, uh, you know, so-called natural arguments. Is that at play in Taiwan as well in terms of these international dynamics? Sorry, that's, you have two minutes for no. huge <laughs> questions. Apologies, but I'll no, no. pass yeah, uh, I would like to thank uh, Navida and uh, Dr. Ayu for, for these uh, wonderful questions. So, 
uh, I do think, although, uh, and that's, uh, I think that's a very good question, uh, the one proposed by Navida, because that's also uh, what I'm uh, doing. Uh, that's what I'm doing in terms of, of my research. That is, I try to evaluate the impact of uh, the passage of same-sex marriage in Taiwan and how that uh, polit important political event affect uh, LGBTI activism in other uh, East Asian societies. So uh, for now, I would say it's still not clear regarding whether uh, there's actually a causal relationship uh, between uh, the, the, these policy change in Taiwan and how it would, could uh, be, uh, uh, it could be a spill over to other East Asian societies. But uh, one thing to uh, be noted here is that uh, I think, uh, I, I, I believe that there will still be some path dependent uh, effects related to uh, uh, activists in other East Asian societies they could learn from the experience of Taiwan and uh, regarding how gay rights should be framed in a Confucian uh, cultural influence society. And uh, the, the, the uh, gay rights organizations in Taiwan uh, did not uh, cease to function. They are still thriving in Taiwan. And I believe they will also reach out to uh, these different uh, activist groups in other East Asian countries and then build that transnational connection. And that is also another point uh, to observe. That is how Taiwanese uh, activist groups uh, provide resources to other uh, activist groups uh, in uh, East Asian societies. And uh, going back to the question proposed by uh, Dr. Ayub, uh, I, yes, so it's not a, a, a very homogeneous group in terms of, uh, especially for the anti-gay rights uh, side. So, but interestingly, although uh, uh, the Christian popularity in Taiwan is not that huge, but I would argue that based on uh, my understanding of these pro -gay, uh, these anti-gay rights groups in Taiwan, they are still mainly driven by uh, 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 the the, the uh, religious con religious conservatives, especially with uh, a Christian uh, with the background of Christianity or Catholicism. Yeah. So although they try to build a diver diverse collision uh, to. Uh, uh, to oppose, uh, yeah, same-sex marriage, but we can still see a clear, like, a leading role played by the Christian population uh, in Taiwan. Thank you so much, Dr. Dai. I would like to now pass it back to Professor Minjo, who I saw also had a question in the chat that I didn't see until the end. I apologize for that, but maybe you'll still be able to ask it, um, passing back to you. Thank you so much, and thank you so much. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, thank you so much for everyone. Um, and thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Dai, for your very informative presentation. Uh, and thank you, Professor Ayu, for your intellectually stimulating um, uh, moderation of the Q&A. And um, so I hope, every, I hope everybody have a good night. And also, please pay attention to our center's website.